Welcome to Drama Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. I'm your host, Jess Cording. I'm a registered dietitian, health coach, and author, and I'm here to help you streamline your wellness routine and establish a sane, more balanced relationship with food and fitness so you can reach your goals without losing your mind. On this podcast, we'll talk about nutrition, exercise, self care, mindset, and more. I'll be bringing you interviews and expert insight on the topics that matter to your health and wellness. Hi, and welcome back to the Drama Free Healthy Living Podcast. I'm your host, Jess Cording. I'm so happy you're here with me today. I have a fellow RD on. You guys know I love bringing on dietitians from all different backgrounds because I love showcasing just how many things one can do in this field. It's a wacky time to be a dietitian in today's world. So I love featuring women who are kicking ass. And we have some dietitians out there as well. Not as many. I actually, I don't think I've had any dietitians. Sorry, that was not nice. Any male dietitians on the show, but I think we need to change that soon. But anyway, I digress. Today, I am chatting with none other than Deanna Wolf. So I, Deanna and I don't remember how we first connected, but she and I have collaborated on a number of media projects and she always brings such a refreshing perspective to the table. For those of you who don't know her yet, Deanna is a business coach and pioneer in the online health space, creating a loyal community of over 300,000 followers via Instagram and TikTok at Dietitian Deanna and her blog, dietitiandeanna.com. That's to date. I'm sure that, you know, that will continue to grow. But she's also been noted one of the top 10 mental health podcasts, um, Deets, D-E-A-T-S, with Deanna, where her audience trusts her with sound, non-diet, uh, nutrition advice, and health entrepreneur inspiration. She's also been featured as the most one of the most influential people in wellness of 2022 by Ness. Um, she's, she's dozens of coaches, um, nutrition, fitness, and health professionals grow sustainable online businesses through her online entrepreneur academy. And we talk a little bit about today her journey of developing and growing that program. We also talk about you know her experience moving from a registered dietitian in a hospital to founding her own business, which started as a food freedom business. Um, But she's, you know, she and she talks very candidly about what that experience has been like. I always appreciate when people share about the the real the reality behind behind the scenes. Dan is regularly featured in articles from Health Magazine, Today Show, New York Post and others and speaks to a number of dietetic and entrepreneur focused organizations. Uh, I think that you will get a lot out of today's episode, whether you're a dietitian or not. You know, we also talk a lot about just the like balancing work and life. We talk about mom guilt and managing family life and professional life. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Enough of me talking. Let's get to it. Deanna, welcome to the podcast. Jessica, I'm so excited. It was exciting when you asked me. I feel like we work together in so many different ways in the media to then see you have your own podcast and that you're growing it. I think every dietitian needs a podcast. So... <laughs> I don't have a podcast business. I help a lot of women with their businesses, but it was really cool to get to be featured on another dietitian podcast. Yeah, I love featuring RDs on here because there's just, you know, as we were talking about before we started recording, you know, there's just so much that we can do in this field and we're so much more than, you know, giving out meal plans. Amen. And I think if people want a free meal plan from us, they want a quick fix and that's not the type of people we want to help anyway. Right. Yeah, exactly. There's tons of resources for <laughs> people online. Um, and, you know, something I really appreciate about your work is that you have put, you know, I mean, you do incredible work in helping women navigate food freedom and developing more intu- intuitive eating approaches. But you also have done quite a lot in helping healthcare providers, and especially dietitians, really you know, help them grow their businesses and empower them and just, you know, help them step into that. And I'd I'd love to hear a little bit about what drew you to the field and, you know, what inspired you to to take that direction. I never thought I'd work in food freedom because I struggled with an eating disorder myself. And I it was so triggering when I was actually in school to be a dietitian. And I had to do two weeks at an eating disorder inpatient mental hospital. And I thought every day I would cry going in. I thought this is too close to home. I can't help people in this way. And it's so funny now, years later, to realize I'm helping me 10 years ago, right? Like I am helping that population. So I started out like thinking I'd be a doctor. I decided after my eating disorder, working with dietitians, I 
went to the University of Pittsburgh and just fell in love with learning about nutrition like most dietitians do because we want to, you know, I even say I wanted to learn the perfect diet for me to eat, to excel in everything that I did. And then I did a bodybuilding show and I kind of started like a little side business then. People said like, how would you tone up? And I was helping people count macros and I realized I don't want to be doing that. I don't, I don't want to be doing that with kids, my future kids. It's kind of unhealthy in general. I shifted into food freedom and helping women in that way. I still remember my first client. Her name is Olivia, if you're listening. And she was so inspiring to me, the, the changes she made. And I thought, this is, this is it for me. And I, it truly lit me up. I created food freedom programs on the side, one-to-one and group. And then it became so successful and I was still working full time. And then I decided to quit. Other health professionals started to ask me, how did you make such a successful program? How are you marketing it so clearly and selling it so well to make six figures? And then I started coaching other health professionals, therapists, physical therapists, IAN coaches, eating disorder recovery coaches, dietitians, dietetic interns, and to really like build a profitable, sustainable, scalable business that's not just like one-off consults and follow-ups, you know, which is what we're all used to and taking insurance and the headache of your own practice, I've made private practice fun again. Like it doesn't have to be this like, you know, stingy thing that we grew up with that most of our professors as dietitians tell us to not do, or it takes a good five to 10 years to get into and you need to work in the hospital first. So that's kind of a long-winded answer of how I got into this and why I decided to even go into food freedom and business coaching and all that. So I hope that helps paint the picture a little bit. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. And I, I love hearing people's origin stories because we all, in this field especially, I feel like everybody has has one. And, you know, there's so few people that I've met in this field who are like, yeah, I just always thought food is really interesting. Like, I feel like there's always like, like a mission or like a personal need. And I can relate. I, um, I've, I've spoken very, very openly about my experience with disordered eating at the age of like 11, 12. And it was working with a dietitian that, and a therapist, but it showed me like, oh, I don't, I don't have to be, this stuff can be easy. This doesn't have to be hard. And it was so valuable. It saved me so much heartache down the road. And, you know, and we all have our stuff. And I know my own PTSD struggles, you know, were, led me down a different, you know, a more specific path in terms of looking at the intersections between nutrition and lifestyle and mental health. But like, I remember as a, as a, I must have been my early 20s, someone gave me a, um, they gifted me an astrological chart reading. And I'm very, like, it's funny. I grew up around a lot of um, alternative healthcare. My mom is a psychotherapist, but also a hypnotherapist. So I grew up with that influence, but also a lot, you know, Western medicine and everything. Part of why I went so clinical with my training. But I think that stuff is really fun. And I remember finding out that I had um, Chiron, the wounded healer, in my car- the career sector of my chart. And I was like, hmm. That checks out. <laughs> like, and what does I, that mean for you then? So it's the way that it, it seems to show up is that, you know, a lot of the work that I've done is really stem from things I have struggled with in the past. And what you shared about, you know, helping yourself 10 years ago, I can relate to that so much. You know, it, it, but, it, it, you know, I think if if you're not, you know, in the beginning, it, it, there certain things can be triggering to get up close to. And I've certainly had that experience with other types of issues that, you know, when you encounter, it's so fascinating too how um, what you might be struggling with, suddenly your clients all seem to be struggling with that thing. It's just, an, and my, my clients who are therapists have told me that it happens for them as well. It's like some weird. Uh, like Sometimes I'm like, it's just good marketing. When they tell me the exact same thing that I've like shared too, I'm like, maybe it's just good marketing. But a lot of times, yeah, I've had clients, I lost my period for eight years, had hypothalamic amenorrhea. And or like when I became a mom and I didn't want to be an almond mom, you know, so like all of those things, people are like, that was me, too. You know, and like once you put a name to it and other people can name it, that feels really good at step one. And then automatically they're like, well, if you can name it for me and I can realize what it is, maybe you can help me overcome it, too. And I can see that being really helpful in the work that you do with helping your your clients build their businesses and really tap into who they're trying to help. Of course. I I think no, I think if you're struggling with knowing who you want to help, that is everyone feels that way. So 
Almost right. nobody comes in to my start program with like, I know exactly who I'm going to help. I'm definitely going to help the person with, you know, oncology or PCOS. So being able to nail down your life experiences and maybe you want to work with type 1 diabetes and you've never had type 1 diabetes. That's OK, too. We help you in that way, uh, that regard. But a lot of times you have some type of reason why you want to go one way and we just help really define it so that it's clear for that client who really does want to work with you. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing that because I think um, there's this something I I definitely have had to, I've personally struggled with is in my, in my career is just this feeling that everybody else also has, everyone else has it figured out and that somehow like I'm the only one who doesn't. But then I talk to my colleagues and they all feel the exact same way. Yeah. And like, you know, and it's and it's so interesting because you can be such a skilled practitioner, so great at what you do and still struggle with this imposter syndrome. And, you know, I know we we're chatting about this a bit before, but um, I think we should talk about that a little bit because that is something I feel like a lot of people are, you know, it's it's a conversation that's been happening for a while. I don't see it going anywhere, but I'm curious, you know, how how imposter syndrome, how you see it show up, whether that's in yourself or with your clients. In myself, it I think people think I have no imposter syndrome. Well, I think there's sometimes people call imposter syndrome not real. It's just because us as women haven't seen what males see. Like sometimes people just call it like a gender inequality because when I set out to decide to grow my business, you know, I was on track for great years. I thought, you know what? I was in a room and somebody thought, somebody said, do you want to make six figures in your business? And everyone in the conference room raised their hand. And that same speaker said, what about, what about seven? Like, why did nobody challenge that? And why is that nobody's goal? And I was like, I want to make seven figures in my business, annual profit in one year. And I did it the next year. And I just kept on thinking, why haven't I been in the right rooms that that's reality for women? And is it reality for men, but not for women? And are the rooms available for men to get that way in their own businesses, but not women because women have to be the caretakers? You know, there's just like so many things in my head. But usually for other people, imposter syndrome shows up like I don't have enough knowledge, right? Like if that's you, that is number one. It's like I need and just I don't know how many certificates or trainings or extra, you know, extra courses you've taken on what you want to go into before actually usually we have the skills already, right? So if you're doubting your abilities and feeling like I'm a fraud, I don't know enough, nobody would ever work me with work with me in that way, you have to realize you have enough. You have enough training and you have the knowledge, especially if you're a dietitian, that you have to get that out of your head because there are people doing it already, doing it at 25% of what you would give a client who have no education, no training at all, already doing it and being 90% more successful than you are. So the imposter syndrome has to, and honestly, I don't know how you feel. I almost feel like that stems back to our schooling. I'm like, why do doctors come out and their professors are like, you're the fucking greatest. And like, why do we come out of school beat down? I feel like after school, my, I was like, I don't know anything. <laughs> what? I felt so beat down after my internship that I think that has to stem from either our schooling and I do a lot of speaking at universities about private practice. And most of the women say, our professors have told us private practice isn't realistic. And that really upsets me because I see we've helped 350 clients start or scale a private practice. And I see the success. So to me, it is reality. But to maybe professors who have always worked clinically, it's not. So I think imposter syndrome could definitely show up in that way. I also see it in somebody said no to the price of my program. And so nobody will ever pay for my program. Like it's too expensive, right? So I don't know. I think that a lot of stems from the imposter syndrome. So number one is always like, I'm doubting my abilities. I don't have enough experience. I need to get more certifications. No, you don't. Number two is like, nobody will ever pay for this. It's too expensive. I'm struggling understanding how anybody would pay for this if I don't pay for it. And that's a lot of money mindset work. Um, number three, I think is like, my family around me doesn't get it. And so like, is this even a lucrative career? <laughs> like, And I'm like, my parents still don't get what I do, but they're so freaking proud of me and they know it is something I'm so passionate about. So I don't know how else imposter syndrome shows up for you. 
but that's what I hear the most. Yeah, no, I can relate to a lot of that. I mean, especially for me, it has definitely shown up in the the money mindset. Like I was telling you earlier, I hold my breath every time I send an invoice. It's like for, you know, for a speaking engagement, my fee is my fee. But I like and no one's ever maybe once, maybe five or six years ago, someone was like, oh, that seems like a lot. But 99.9% of the time, they're like, okay, great. We'll get your check in the mail. Like no one ever says like, that's too much. I've I've also been told I undercharged and then started charging more. And nobody had a problem with that. But it's every, you know, and I keep waiting for there to come a point where that doesn't happen. And maybe one day it will. But that is always fascinating to me. Or whenever I raise my coaching rates, you know, I, I don't, I only do it every few years. I did it more recently this year for the first time since like probably pre-COVID, which is bad. But all um, right, I, we got to shift that girl. Right. I was like, I, I remember looking, I was like doing my taxes. I was like, Jess, what, what are you thinking? It just had like one of those moments. Right. But like, you know, I think for myself, something that comes up is trying to do too much or not saying, not setting boundaries. And that's something I do see with the, the people that I work with. Um, and it shows up in different ways for them. But like, you know, with the saying no is so hard. And I think a lot of that, I know for myself, a lot of it, I have realized part of it is trauma response and wanting to like prove that I can do all the, just as much as anyone else who doesn't have trauma history. But I think a lot of it is like old learned behaviors about like, if you're productive, you know, that's, that means like, you know, that you're safe and, you know, there's, but, you know, something I've had friends tell me about is they have anxiety that if they say no to something, that that opportunity will dry up or if they say not right now. Um, And I've definitely had moments of that. And I have to remind myself that like, you know, what is meant for you will not pass you by. Not that you should sit back and just like wait for things to happen, you know, but like that I think that that is something that comes up for me is like the the overworking, the people pleasing and always trying to like, you know, remember that, you know, our our training, our education, really good quality training. Like the, I sometimes I, I forget because I'm just so used to going about day to day life and all the random things that we do. But, you know, if I'm tested, like if I'm giving a speaking engagement and it's Q&A time, I'm like, oh, OK, I actually do know all this shit. Wow. OK. <laughs> like it's it, like those moments like sneak up on you. Yeah. And with the money piece, I think once you if you're getting yeses to 99.9% of your price, I would almost say you're still undercharging because I always say if you're getting 75% or greater yeses to that, like even my conversion rate for when people apply and want to learn from me and want in is 50%, like 30 to 50%, right? And that's a good close rate in overall close rates of sales process in general. So for me, if, which honestly in my scale program, ours is closer to 75%, but we truly have a price that we feel like gets the ROI. Almost everyone makes their money back in the program. Like it just feels really good right now. So I don't know if we're going to raise our rates, but I think I challenge my clients even in month like two of their business to raise their rates. Because after you have your first two or three clients, you've already built the confidence so for you, if you're waiting like years and years, I'm yeah, like, don't see what I do. <laughs> raise it, you know, 150 to 200 dollars after your first three to five clients, and we do a lot of like income mapping, rev- recurring revenue in my program. So it's like, wow, I can see the difference of just raising my price 200 dollars and signing on, you know, three clients at that versus what it was before. And I think truly, if you want somebody to have a, you know, think about what you invest in. If, if somebody wants a $2,000 result, they're going to pay for a $2,000 product. If somebody wants a $25 result, they're going to pay for a $25 product and their result is going to suck, right? So we price our programs differently. And when they're priced at a point, people put in the work and they're more likely to be so excited that they get a $2,000 result instead of a $500 result. Because most of the time, the price objections Or for that $500 product because they just don't fully believe in the result that they're going to get. And wouldn't they rather have a $2,000 result anyway? It's like why you buy a MacBook instead of something else. It's like you want that thing that is the result of having the most expensive product. And thank you for sharing that because I think that's helpful for people who are not dietitians or, you know, people who run their own business to hear that. Because I I think... It is something I have definitely seen with my own programs that that when you are charging for what it's worth, people put in the time and the effort. And then when you don't, when I started though, oh my gosh, <laughs> I was charging so little. 
a colleague of mine sat me down. This was like 10 years ago, but she was so brilliant. She was like, Jess, what you're charging, like people pay more than that for a Manny Petty special on a Wednesday. You are not allowed to charge that little. And it changed my life. I was like, thank God she said that. But I think sometimes if we price things low, one, I think as a provider, it's like we're so burned out trying to churn it out and make it sustainable that we're, we're not able to give good quality care or a good quality product or service. And, you know, and I think if someone is going in there expecting, you know, the equivalent of a Wednesday Manny Petty special, like their expectations are are low and their motivation is really low. And those are often the people who blow you off or don't follow through and and then wonder why they don't see the results that they wanted, you know, and it's it's something I've seen again and again. And a lesson I've certainly learned the hard way in my business. I wish you were in my orbit sooner than later. Right. Oh, my I did. Gosh. I started off with a $250 12 week macro package. So I get it. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like, but you know, we, it's like everything's a learning experience, I guess. Yes. I quickly changed from that. Oh, my gosh. And you now, for when you were like deciding, because something, a conversation that's been coming up a lot in my orbit lately is the idea of pivoting and making a change in your business and your life. You know, was there a point for you where, and when you were, you know, you started doing the the business, well, you started doing the food freedom stuff, you started doing the business coaching, but you were working full time. Like, was there like an aha moment? You were like, all right, enough is enough. Or was it like you had a plan? You're like, all right, I'm going to get to this point that I'm going to go quit this. Like, what was that like for you? No plan. And if you're listening and you're like, I need a business plan, uh, no, you don't. There needs to be some action taking. And I think probably the other imposter syndrome thought I hear all the time is like, I'm a perfectionist. I need it all planned out. And how would I ever get there? Right. Like I every day have to throw my perfection out the window and say, I'm an action taker today. Nothing needs to be perfect. See work is what's going to get done today. And I'm going to take action. And embodying that personality versus a perfectionist. So I've overcome, I really do. I, I'm a perfectionist at my core, but nothing I do is perfect anymore. And that's what's gotten me success, truly, is being less of a perfectionist and more of an action taker every single day. How can I take one little step today? So for me, yes, I pivoted twice. I pivoted from macros to food freedom. I pivoted, I was working full time. I quit three years ago in August. So like three and a half years ago, didn't really have a plan for that either. I knew I needed support right after. So I hired on like somebody to help me at that point in my business right after I quit. And then more of the pivot into the business coaching was really just a lot of the people in my business. For me, like food freedom is my why. Why I started all this. I want to help women in that way. But then my team was like, and we have a team of 12 now. They were like, why aren't we focused a little bit more here and creating kind of a little bit of a different realm for food freedom. And I was like, all right, I guess I can do that. And it took some therapy, but now I get to help women in such a more broad way that it's not just helping the end user with, you know, the the population with food freedom, which lights me up still every day, but it's like helping more health professionals help more people with food freedom, PCOS, mental health, physical therapy, postpartum core work, like, and to be able to make a bigger impact. So for me, it really was like, seeing the silver lining of it's okay to change. And when my clients want to pivot, I hope this is kind of making sense still. Yeah, but no, I love that. I think that's a message a lot of people need to hear that it's okay to change. I think people, they, they wrap yeah. up their identity in what they do or what they, that they think that they're known for. And it makes it really scary to change. Definitely. And it can feel like turning a whole ship at times. But when you have a deep core feeling and you might just be starting your business, right? Or you might be in this kind of pivot where I'm like, come come work with me because I've done a lot of pivoting and I can help. <laughs> but I think it's um, like when you first get started, you might not be super passionate about one thing, but deciding on one thing and learning the skills to sell one thing can expand that then for you to be able to sell other things in the future. So I do think you have to focus on one thing to start, even if it's, you know, what's an example? You know, I keep on coming back to PCOS or like track athletes, focus on that one thing, and then you can broaden after that. But you can't start broad and expect everyone to want to work with you and bang down your door. You have to start with that like one niche. And we talk about sub-niching 
So track athletes who are also moms, right? Like having a niche and a sub niche and have it be something that's profitable is what we talk about too. Like something might light you up, but it is not going to translate to profit at the end of the day. Like there are some niches that just aren't clear enough. So we talk a lot about that in my program too. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And we're going to be linking to all this in the show notes. Yeah. I also like what you said about hiring support. I, this is something I see, especially women struggle with so much. Like, like my client, like just, she's the strong one. She's the one who like everyone comes to her and like, it doesn't even like occur to her to ask for help. And, you know, I, it's, but it's something I see over and over that like, I think on some, some, for some people, it's just an identity thing. It's something they're used to. For others, it's like a badge of honor. Maybe that's like their, their family's way. But then for other people, something I see is I, they, I, they feel like they don't deserve support, whether that's in their business or in their life. Like, they, you know, they don't deserve help with things around the house or with childcare or with, you know, or if it's on the business side, with like admin. It's, it's really, you know, and it's, and so of course they, they get burned out and it's hard to, to really think clearly and do the things that they want to. And then they feel like crap about themselves. They're like, oh, look at the shit job I'm doing. Like, Do you see that at all? What I see show up the most is mom guilt right yeah. now. Is And it makes me so incredibly sad. The moms that feel like they can't take an hour to focus on their own goals, that feel like they're being selfish by having something like their own business, which in my reality... I've shifted that because my own mom went back to school when she was 50 years old and she became a nurse. And I, that is one of the things I'm the most proud of her for. Even though she was a stay at home mom my entire early age, she became a nurse and I knew that was something she really wanted to do. So I remind every mom, it's not guilty or you don't, you don't need to be guilty for taking time to focus on your own passions for light, like filling up your cup first before you can give to your kids. And for moms to tell me, I can't take an hour away from my day. And maybe you want to be with your kids. That's fine, too. But what are you going to do when they're older and they're grown up? Like, is there something you can focus on now for one hour a day, like the flexibility a virtual business provides? Can you hire help for a few hours a week, right? Just had somebody hire on somebody with just for two hours, three times a week to help. So being a stay-at-home mom is amazing. And there are days where I'm like, this is amazing. There are other days where I'm like, this is harder than I thought. And I'm glad I have something else, you know. So every mom will almost always have that thought of like, I want to stay home with my kids. Oh, no, I hate staying home with my kids. Like there's always this like back and forth of like, I just want to bake bread and be with my kids or I want to like climb the corporate ladder thought, which is always in my brain, too. But there just has to be a decision that I can lean on my partner for support. Like, can they put your kids down for bed one night a week so that you can have that time to grow your own thing or focus on your own goals? I think the mom guilt shows up so often and I don't know how to overcome it because for me, it's not guilt. I decided I'm not going to give in to guilt. It's knowing that I deserve what I deserve and to be a mom. Like you don't, don't have to choose. I think that's where a lot of women struggle. Oh my God. Thank you for sharing that because it's, it is so pervasive. It is it is so hard to get for people to get over those those because I think it culturally it runs very, very deep. So I you know, and I know that it's not something that like just like someone telling you like, you know, it'll make it easy to just get over it. But like I, I oh my God. It's you know, it's I can relate though. I grew up my mom worked from home and I grew up basically like on her lap while she took calls and did stuff on those like old old computers and like, you know, and I just that those are some of my earliest memories. And I remember this was a time when not a lot of moms worked. And I remember like my classmates thought it was weird that she worked, which is really, I look back now and that's so that is weird to me that they thought it was so weird. But I was so proud of her. And she went back to school in her 40s. And that's when she became a psychotherapist. And I, you know, just to watch her like grow her practice and like develop her own life, you know, it was just like so inspiring. And I, I always knew that I wanted to set a really good example like that. And like, yes, I learned a lot of my workaholic tendencies from my mother, but, you know, she was really like amazing at, even though she was busy, she always was emotionally present. And that was a really, I didn't, it didn't hit me until a few, until I got married, probably, where there was another human in my world that I had to like care about where I I really understood like how valuable that was. Tell me what that meant for you. Cause I'm still trying to work on like my presence and I feel like I can be away from my phone, but still in la la land sometimes. So 
what would she do to be emotionally present so I know what yeah, she did well, well? I know this sounds weird, but like eye contact or just like, um, or like if we were close, like touch, like, you know, just like me being on her lap or at her feet and that just being cool. Like, you know, she also was just like, she wouldn't like shut me up. Like I was never like, I wasn't like a really like, loud kid but I had a lot of questions like I always had to know why like and she was yeah. very patient even when she was exhausted she was just really I mean every mom has their moments where they're like come on I need a break like she was yeah. very human but like I remember growing up and she was like very real she talked to me like a person like the eye contact and but she also would remind me sometimes like I'm here if you need me you know if it's really important I'm I'm here. And when, you know, she started working out, she started working outside of the house when I was maybe in middle school or high school. And that's a time where, you know, they're like, you're too cool for your parents, except you really need them. And, you know, we just always, um, and it's still this way, like, you know, just we're very close emotionally. We just are able to talk about anything. And I know that not everyone has that, but just like that openness and that just like that, like it was OK to feel whatever emotions you were feeling and just to like know that she was there was really, really helpful. And it just was really. um. So I've, I've tried to bring that to 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 my, you know, my work. But, as, you know, even in my marriage, like, you know, my husband and I, you know, are we don't like I have I know so many people, both them and their spouse work from home. We have the opposite situation. And. You know, so we're in touch all day via text and just like always just reminding each other, like, you know, I've got your back. We're in this together. Like, you know, and just that, like, you know, we talk on the phone, which as an elder millennial and he's like, an, you know, he's a little older. So his phone is maybe not as weird to him. But like, that's a big thing for us. And I grew up watching my parents, you know, talk because my dad worked so late a lot and he had to travel a lot. And I, it was just a really good example of just ways to be close and in touch, even if physically your work was T taking your attention. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. It sounds like she was patient. She was around to touch and like be okay with touching you. And she listened. Yeah, that's the listening is like, I, I don't know how she did it sometimes, <laughs> but she, oh, no wonder she's a therapist. Like she is very good at listening. You know, and this, the stuff that, you know, you've been sharing is just so I think is going to be so helpful for our listeners to hear, because I just think sometimes people feel like they are the only one who like doesn't have it figured out or they don't know what they want to do or they feel like everyone else is like light years ahead of them. If there is some like so someone out there listening that they're like, oh, I know I want to make a change or start charging more or I know I deserve more. Like the same thing that you would tell them is like something that you want, you know, you'd say, all right. This is where you should start or think of it this way. Oh, I think it like the charging more thing. Think about your uncle who's a lawyer. Is he going to give it to you for free just because he's your uncle? Or I always say like, will you let them love you? Will you let them pay for your services so that they can show like you are worth it to me and I believe in what you're doing. So let that person love you, even if they're a cousin's friend or whatever. And think about that. If I was a lawyer, would I still be paying for this? Probably because I need the support so much that I wouldn't just expect it for free. So why are you trying to sell your services for free when you would pay somebody else in a different expertise for the money, right? So the money thing, yes, you should charge your worth. Yes, you're going to get no's, but there's going to be somebody that says yes. And that's like the happiest day of your life too, right? Where you're like, wow, I did this and I made it possible. If you're thinking about shifting, I think you, I always think about where do I want to be in five years? Do I still want to be talking about the same thing? If not, I need to do the hard work and decide it's time for me to make the change, get some support behind you with a coach or a mentor who's done a change or knows how to change and make the pivot, right? If you're so unhappy in your job and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get started, but I need somebody to help me. That's where we're at. If you're like, I'm doing all this one-to-one -one work and I hate it and I'm burnt out from my own business and you want to scale, that's also where we're at. So I think both those things can really be addressed easily in my mind. Not that you can't, don't need to work on them every day, but you can't just like throw them on the back burner and expect them to go away. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And the comment about the back burner is amazing. I am. Um... And it reminds me like something I've had to learn in my own career is when I was younger, maybe this is my Sagittarian side, but I would get to that point of starting to feel like restless and ready for a change. And then my impulse was always to just like burn it all down. 
instead of being like, all right, what's working? What's not working? How can I? I, I just remember like when I finally realized I'd been doing that all those years, I was like, oh, all right, well, that's not too late to learn a new way of doing things. Yeah. But thank you for sharing that. And I know we've been talking about your programs and, you know, the the coaching that you do. And for people who are interested in learning more about your work, what's the best way for them to do that? Check it out on social media. I mean, we have my website, dietitiandiana.com, and you can go under programs. My program is called Online Entrepreneur Academy. It's a four-month live coaching program with me where you're learning how to niche, start your services, create your services sell your services, launch, have your first 10K month, and um, even do more behind the scenes, build your email list, find referrals in person in order to have the business of your dreams. And then if you're scaling, we also have our scale program, which is for women who are already at that five to 10K a month mark and are ready to scale into group programs and courses and sell confidently and not have all these like mindset issues too. We work a lot through that with some experts in our program and lots of tools and templates. So I also have a page at online.entrepreneur.academy, which you could find in my dietitian, Deanna, that's dietitian with two T's profile on Instagram or check out my website, or I also have a podcast, Deets with Deanna, where we talk about super similar things. So I feel like if you love this episode, you would love a lot of the Deets with Deanna episodes with other dietitians who are successful, who never thought they'd be successful, Um, physical therapists, CrossFitters, so many different backgrounds. Amazing. And we will be linking to all that in the show notes to make it super simple for people to find. And thank you for reminding us how to spell dietitian. This is like one of the, oh my God, like it's not a hill I thought I'd want to die on, but it comes up all the time. I know. I just saw the meme of like, I never thought I'd spend so much of my my career defending bananas. And I feel that to my core as well. (laughs) Just talking with someone about that the other day. (laughs) Every freaking day. It's just, wow. We need to give bananas the avocado treatment, you know? Blending bananas, they're toxic. It's, yeah, it's it's in any way bananas. Oh, the things we're doing with our degrees. <laughs> um, so, Deanna, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been such a joy talking to you. I have one question I ask yes. everybody. And, okay, so there is, you know, we hear about wellness, healthy living. I know these are very, like, you know, overused terms. But yeah. what I love about about exploring this is just it can look so different from one person to the next one day to the next so my question for you today is just Deanna today at this moment in time what does healthy living mean to you to me it's not being perfect it's really the ebb and flow of allowing my body to be what it needs to be since I'm you know eight months pregnant right now too it's just like allowing me to ebb and flow with each stage of life and knowing that my body might change, my diet might change, whether I'm eating just beige carbs or, you know, I need to supplement with extra iron right now. I think it's just like letting the ebb and flow be and not kind of just like a one size fits all. It's really healthy living is freedom to me of like getting to do what I want. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is beautiful. And I love that. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'm so happy I was here. Yeah, and I'm so glad we could finally do this. And all of you guys who are out there listening on your devices, I don't know, maybe you're out for a walk, doing the dishes, taking some much needed you time. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, If you like what you hear, pop on over to Deanna's podcast and subscribe. If you are enjoying this episode, I would also love if you consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. They do matter and help me continue to bring you great guests like Deanna. So as always, guys, have a wonderful day and we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to Drama-Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. We'll see you next time.